Thomas J. Smith, Council Chambers at 4.30. And I think we're going to skip the regular agenda and go right to the discussion items so the police department can do their presentation on the canine program. And we'll do that first. Thank you this evening. Uh, myself and Officer Smith are here today to uh, present to you a proposal uh, by us. It's not so much a proposal to you, but for the community, we're going to try and uh, reinitiate our canine program at the police department. Uh, several months back, uh, Officer Smith had taken an interest uh, in the canine program and had brought some information uh, to the administration at the department uh, wanting to uh, uh, have a canine for our department, and he's willing to uh, be the handler for that. With that information, we've put together a presentation and have, have uh, basically presented it to a leadership group here in town that does some fundraising, and uh, we're going to continue on and move forward with that uh, initiative and try to reach a goal to fund this program for three to five years, initially starting with three. But we're going to go through a presentation here, a little bit about it, and uh, if you have any questions at the end, we'll be happy to answer those questions. Uh, like I said, Officer Smith is going to do part of the presentation, then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, financing of it and, and how the funds all come together. Officer Smith. Right. Hello, everyone. Officer Smith. Got a little background here. Been an officer since 2007 in tactical response unit for the last four years, water rescue team for six, and been in charge of the Honor Guard for the last year. Um, a military background, been Illinois Army National Guard since 2003. I've had two deployments. <clears throat> All right, with the Bronson PD K-9 history, and past we've had three. As you can see, the first two K-9s we've had, we've had two different officers and um, that were the handlers. Um, that just kind of puts out there that the K-9 can be um, handled by another officer if needed. So if I do get deployed again or uh, if I go to somewhere else, which probably won't be the case, uh, another officer can step in my place and take over the EK9 program. And the recent K9 is Officer or Officer Bloomer was a handler with the K9 Reno. All right. Uh, the community need for the K9 has different, well, multiple different, uh, say, various uh, specialties for K9s. One for the for our community, probably be the dual purpose, and that consists of the narcotics detection, tracking, and defense. Um, just below that, we have um, what it's all considered that can actually do the narcotics detection, drug interdiction, tracking, defense, crowd control, and presence patrol, and the building article searches. And we'll get into those here in a little bit. Um, with our K9 in the county, if we do go with the program, get the canine, we'll be the only canine in the county. Um, and that is for more immediate and greater availability. We won't have to wait for um, state prison canine team to come up or other agencies around the area. The narcotics detection and drug interdiction. With the patrol canine, be vehicles, structure and area searches, the types of contraband that can be um, used to locate Marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, um, heroin, and all those, uh, some other um, controlled substances. The DA certified, that would actually be if we do get the funds to go ahead and do an extra <coughs> training for the DA. The DA will train um, the canine and myself and actually um, provide us with drugs that are not common or commonly seen in this community, just uh, in case. And that drug does come into town, we can stop it beforehand, before it gets uh, a greater problem, let's just say. The tracking. Um, there's multiple situations where we can use tracking with the canine, the you know, fleeing suspects, and the missing children and adults. Uh, fleeing suspects is if somebody happens to run from a vehicle and they are. Um, say a danger to the community, we can actually have the canine come in, take a scent from that person that was in that vehicle, and then that canine can track that person. And defense, 
if a certain situation comes to hand, if there's an armed subject and he's a threat to an officer, another officer, the community, um, or the dog itself, the dog can actually be used as a defense um, tool. Crowd control. Um, canine, just its presence in the area will probably either deter um, some situations or actually if um, some people do see a canine, they're like, well, I don't want to be anywhere near that thing. I'm going to go home and, and live another day. <laughs> so presence patrol, again, deterrence of crime. We can use these at major events in the community. Um, just having that canine there will make people think twice about um, doing something criminal or um, unethical. The building article searches. We can let a canine go through a building and actually locate somebody that is possibly hiding in the, in the building. Um, also, if we do have a subject inside somewhere and he's not wanting to come out, we can send the canine in. Uh, also, on a crime scene, there's evidence that possibly won't be found by the officer in the naked eye. The dog can go in and actually search and hit on um, things that an officer probably won't be able to see or is hidden. And for the example is a gun, knife, and strike an instrument. Um, tactical deployment, with me being on the tactical response unit, we can actually take the canine and myself and go to a tactical response um, canine school and get that canine certified in tactical situations. Um, if the tactical response unit is um, called out, then the situation is extremely dangerous. And the canine tool will actually help prevent um, further damage or loss of life if there is a certain situation that, that can happen. And then the canine demonstrations, everybody's favorite. Um, again, we can do pretty much for any organization that wants to see what the dog can do, we can do demonstration for them. Also gives the uh, community a, uh, a view of what the dog can do and actually get that dog out there to where um, everybody wants to see the dog in action. So there's two different breeds that um, I'm in looking for what I prefer is the German Shepherd. Um, the size and presence of it is more, I'd say, um, more commanding, more demanding. Um, presence patrol of other than the Belgian Malinois, which we'll get in the next slide. And also with the German Shepherds, from my experience with other handlers and their and other breeders. The German Shepherd is actually can turn off work. So in a normal setting off duty, the, the German Shepherd excuse me, German Shepherd can actually act as a pet and be sociable. Um, the next <clears throat> breed of canine is the Belgian Malinois. They are kind of the cousin of the German Shepherd. They're smaller, leaner, um, and they're actually a lot hyper than the German Shepherd. Some of the handlers that have a Belgian Malinois um, always tell me that they never shut off. They're always wanting to, wanting to work. So, and with the uh, sociable part from, or part of them is they really don't um, pay attention to anybody unless there's something they can sniff on you. The work life of the canine, um, five to eight years, usually after five to six, the canine kind of gets burnt out um, and kind of loses its um, ability to perform. Lifespan of both breeds is approximately 11 years, and the canine will actually live with me um, so I don't have to kennel it up at some, somewhere where I'm off duty and actually go home and be part of the family. All right, training. The federal mandate for canine training in law enforcement is 16 hours a month, and that is a minimum. Now, that training has to be documented. 
And the training that consists is narcotics detection, bite work, tracking, and obedience. That's a great picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's obedience. Yeah. Uh, the narc narcotics detection, um, again, if the DEA um, certified, I can have um, uh, access to drugs that we don't har or commonly see in the community. Bite work, we do have a full bite suit, so I'm sure if anybody wants to feel a bite, they can do so without getting injured. And then tracking and obedience, that'll be just the uh, addition to those um, um, training subjects. All right. Officer Smith uh, has uh, done a lot of work in looking at the, the dogs that he uh, is preferring that we get, and we've taken that into consideration. He's also looked and shopped around at different uh, companies that basically sell canines and offer the training, and, and we boiled it down to uh, Canine Working Dogs International, and they have like a three-week training course there for uh, Officer Smith to go to. Once we purchase the dog, he'll go there and train on site with the dog, and they also uh, do some work with uh, the uh, outfitting of the vehicle and making sure everything's uh, good to go when he comes back. There's no cost, no additional, I guess, no additional work for us to do back here, getting the car ready to go for the canine. It's all done there and part of that cost. Uh, the tuition uh, cost there, is, as you see, is um, 2195 uh, and it, like I said, on-site lodging. And the canine leap grant that you see there, there is uh, grant applications for some equipment that we could apply for once we purchase the dog there. So that would be down the road. And of course the vehicle insert package. Uh, the total, I, I broke it down here, the approximate cost is basically $22,000. I'm rounding up because as we move further along in the process, of course, as we go deeper into it, the price may go up of the dog. Uh, 14500 for the canine basically 3500 for the vehicle insert and the system inside to open the dog, which includes air conditioning and heat back there for the dog for in the summertime to keep the dog cooled down when he's in the car, uh, and 2195 for the, the training itself, and then there's an import charge because the dogs for this company come from Germany, and that's the, the cost of that charge. So basically it all adds up to $22,000. Additional optional equipment, basically, the collar will come with it, of course, but the vest, the Kevlar vest, the bulletproof vest for the dog is anywhere from 900 to 1400 and I always caution on the high side, and, uh, of course, the collar was free, but I, I included the $1,500 in there. Uh, handler's uniforms for Officer Smith, as you see, the, the uniform he has on has some polyester in it, and what, you know, what we know will happen is the minute he starts working with the dog, uh, the hair gets on it. It's not as comfortable for him to work with, and plus he has things that he will have in his cargo pockets and things of that nature for the dog to work with uh, on the scene, either to reward the dog or leashes or things of that nature. So we'll change his uniform a bit to a different style. And we talk about the outer load-bearing vest, which basically brings everything up here, which gives him access to his pockets down here a little bit better than, than what we have on. So there's some options there. And that's the reason for the change of the uniform. It would just be an additional cost for us to initially purchase those uniforms. Any expenses after that for replacement would probably come out of our budget. Overtime compensation, which is a big figure. Uh, we have to provide, because Officer Smith will have the dog at his residence and care for the dog in the off-duty hours, not just during when he's working. He'll have the dog at his house. He'll have to have a kennel there uh, and feed the dog take the dog out for the bathroom, make sure it's, it's taken care of uh, at, his, at his residence. And we've checked with several other uh, law enforcement agencies on, on what the requirement is, and there's some mandates there for eight hours per pay period, which is uh, eight hours every two weeks, basically 16 hours a month. So I've done some figures here. For the initial cost uh, for his overtime is $26,100 for the first three years, and then uh, for the total of five years, would be 44500 and I included in there just a, an estimate of a 2% annual salary increase just to try to make sure I was a little more accurate with my figures. So if we're looking for th the initial startup for just the overtime is 26100 
and this explains a little bit about the food, veterinary care, the kennel at his house, and boarding. A lot of, I know during, when we had the other canines before, like Reno and, and uh, Kilo and them, local businesses around here are very generous in our community that provide for us the concrete slab they'll provide, they provide uh, the panels for the kennel, uh, the dog food, I think it was uh, Hy-Vee that provided that before, but we'll try to solicit donations for those uh, things also, and I think uh, <coughs> All Goods handled the veterinary care for uh, the previous canines, so we would uh, seek those out also. Uh, I've, I've broken this up, or I figured this up, total funds for the initial three-year goal, uh, and like I said, is basically 22000 for the initial purchase and training of the dog. Uh, I put in there 2250 for the additional equipment and uniforms, and then uh, 26000 for the overtime compensation. So the, the minimum we're going to shoot for is basically 50400 to get the program started for the, for the first three years, and then we'll look for additional funding once we get it, once we get it initiated. Uh, the total funds for the five years uh, is basically 70000 I included in there some, and it's a little on the low, slide, low side, that $1,250, $1,250 for continuing certification and training because it may cost more than that, but that's on the low side, approximately $70,000 would be um, the total for the five years of this program. And if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer. I don't understand the overtime. The officer's assigned to a regular shift, is that right? Yes, he is. But then he might be called in for the K-9 on an overtime basis. Is that that, that's works? correct. That would be additional. When he's called in from off duty to come in and uh, utilize the dog, that would be in addition to what you're seeing up here. What this here is for, Mr. Fleming and Council, is that the figure that eight hours per pay period is basically for the, the dog's care, to make sure the dog's cared for at home because he's taking care of the property which belongs to the oh, city, if that makes sense. He's basically the caretaker of the animal for those eight hours every two weeks. And that's basically 14 days, you know, basically a little over an hour a day. Thank you. Any other questions? The dog is trained in English? Uh, I think the last one was in German, and this one may be also since it's coming from Germany, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So how's your German? <laughs> right now it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping to three weeks down there he'd learn some German maybe. Yeah, where is the training center? Where is it? Langford, Kansas. Okay. Or actually Longford, Kansas. Sorry. Longford, Kansas, yeah. Okay. So basically we're trying to get the word out there and we'll, you'll hear about us uh, going around town. I already have uh, a group that called me today and wants, uh, wants me to come and present there over the next couple months and, and so we're going to be looking for donations to hopefully reach our goal and, and get this program reinitiated uh, for the city. What do you need from us? Nothing other than just your awareness of what we're trying okay. to do. Our blessing. That would be it. Yeah. Any other good. Questions? good? Let's do it. Okay, okay, thank Council, you. Councilman Wilson. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Oh, sure. um, you guys talked about the DEA certification and also tactical. I don't know if that's, are those like optional? Those are optional. Op optional trainings. Would you, I guess then, like what would be estimated cost and time for that? Or is it ongoing as well? It would be ongoing. Um, the, the DEA certification, you certify every two years. Um, I don't know exact price for that. A lot of the, uh, um, I like the tactical response mm -hmm. unit. That actually be a one-time training. Um, and then we'd train on it as my, or myself mm -hmm. um, throughout the years. Um, the DEA certification from what I hear from uh, other handlers is that it's, it's more of a, uh, the DEA wants certified. So if the DEA does come into the community, they can actually use my, or utilize my dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, more of a, uh, like a federal grant kind of. It probably won't come out too much of our um, pocket. So. Okay. Are those uh, two things something you would want to do? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. I think it'd be. I think I'm really excited. Um, I guess you know when people want to make donations, where where can they go to make a donation? 
Well, right now, um, and the chief and I just talked about that today, we haven't laid down, we're, we're looking for a, um, I guess a, I guess, what am I looking for? A 501c3 organization that'll, that'll manage the account for us to, to get us through uh, mm -hmm. that process and, and manage those funds for us. They just wouldn't come to the city. And uh, we're, we haven't started that. We're gonna get out there. We haven't received any money. So once that okay. happens, we'll, we'll probably go a direction <clears throat> like that. And you talk about the certification. Annually, there's certifications or there's certifications for the dog uh, to show performance that he will need to have mm -hmm. for, the for, for the dog to work. And in case there is a bite or something like that, he can show you know, the dog has performed and, and responds as it needs to uh, in accordance with its initial training. Right. So there's certifications that way. Okay. So is there additional um, insurance coverage that needs to be with this or will it fit under our current umbrella I have, coverages? I, we haven't even talked about that. I, I feel it would probably come under uh, our current policy, but uh, the chief and I can talk about that for sure. Okay. Initially, you, you had had the question about the tactical response unit, mm -hmm. his training with the tactical response unit. It's basically a, a group that's made up of Des Moines County officers, or sheriff's deputies and police officers here, and uh, we would probably discuss that training fee uh, with them because okay. they're going to be util right. utilizing it together for that unit. Okay. So. Do you currently bring in a canine unit occasionally? We do, we do have one that's available by a, by a private person. He charges by the hour and he comes from Mount Pleasant. I see. And we do that and we also utilize the ones from the, uh, the Iowa State Penitentiary to do uh, like the, the sniffs out at the schools and stuff like that. Well, you have to let us know when you get the everything set up so we can spread the word. I'd like to at least. <laughs> you bet, we will, we will. Thank you for Good your program. time. Open Thank you. Anything Thank else? you. Anything else, Council? No. Nope. Hey, Jim, do you have anything to say about this? Oh, hi, Jim. Okay. Excuse me. I did make it. Yes. Thank you, Major and <laughs> Officer Thank Smith. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on to our regular agenda. The first couple items to deal with at the Council meeting. Uh, Eric, you want to talk about the one f or 1417 Tool Street with the, consent yeah. of the sale of property, please? map of the property. This is a, a property we acquired through the uh, 657A process. It is uh, located on Tool Street between Oak and Flora Street. Um, is a property that does need quite a bit of work. We have received three uh, bids on it uh, currently uh, with a high bid of $5,000 at this point. Uh, we do have a um, sheet on our Facebook page just detailing uh, information on the property. Uh, property summary details and then a summary of the rehab that is to uh, be completed at the property as well. It uh, does need to be cleaned out, plumbing upgrades, uh, electrical, wiring, HVAC, windows, uh, roof. Uh, so there is quite a bit to do there, but uh, with, I guess, most of our recent properties, they come in a condition that there is a lot of work to be done and uh, that's uh, expected by the purchasers. It is a Four bedroom house, three bedrooms upstairs, one bedroom on the main floor with one full bathroom on the main floor as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we uh, do have a current high bid of 5,000, so we'd expect, um, and two other bids, we'd expect at least that $5,000, who has done other work in Burlington as well. Any questions on the property or sale? Another live auction coming then? Yep. Okay, question? Nope. No? No? I'm good. Okay. Okay, next one is interesting. Selling a portion of South 14th Street right away. This is an unusual right away that we've had questions from the neighbors from time to time um, just due to maintenance and use. Uh, it is a city our street right away, 14th Street right away, that also contains an alley uh, just north of Harrison, halfway up the block. Um, the alley doesn't continue all the way to Barrett, but uh, dead ends and comes back out to 14th Street. And the property owners there have all gotten together and uh, wish to actually own uh, part of that right away that covers the uh, alley portion. 
there would be an easement, uh, access easement over the alley, and there are some utilities there. Um, they did a plat of survey, uh, so we have a, a better legal description showing uh, each property getting the adjacent uh, right away there. It would maintain a minimum 60 foot right away through that uh, street, which is our typical street right away. So um, the city wouldn't be losing any necessary right away there, and uh, I guess they'd be responsible for any maintenance within that area. Um, just an unusual situation. I, I don't know of any others where we have a street and an alley in the same right of way in, in town, but uh, hopefully it'll clear up some of the confusion as far as maintenance. We've had nuisances out there where the adjacent property owner wasn't maintaining, even though they're responsible to the center of the street, and they question why there's an alley there, and so hopefully that'll clear that up and uh, make, make the maintenance of the property a little easier to understand going forward. So does that mean the alley goes away then? Pub, well, the public alley would go away, but there is a 15-foot a um, access easement on the property for each of those each of those individuals adjacent to it. They'd be responsible to take their trash out to the street. Uh, I'm not sure which side had been mentioned, but they wouldn't be able to bring it to that alley there. Will they be allowed to build on that property? They couldn't on the 15-foot um, area, and then it, there is still a, a portion remaining, uh, just depending on the setback, if they could have a, a small shed or something there. I would uh, uh, caution you on that. There's private lateral lines that go from those houses on the, a uh, couple of those houses on the east side of the of 14th Street that uh, go to that alley in that, in the, uh, or go to the sewer in the alley. And looking at it, the, the width of this is goes from 31 feet at the north and 39 to the south. There is a 15-foot uh, access easement and then, I believe, a 20-foot utility easement. And based on our setbacks, there probably wouldn't be any room to actually construct there. So, Say that again. There's a 15-foot access easement and a 20-foot utility easement. And based on our setbacks, our front yard setbacks are typically 25 feet. The buildable area goes away essentially then, so there shouldn't be any construction there based on that. Should not be. No. Okay. No. I didn't hear that. Okay, that's pretty routine. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I don't know. I, I still think, uh, I still think the folks on the other side of the street need to be notified. Yeah, we and explain that they have a utility coming off of their house that goes under that property and if they need to uh, access that property they're not going to have an easement to to do that they're um, <clears throat> that that's a that would be a concern of mine if i uh, yeah lived in those houses and I, I would imagine some of those folks don't even know that their their sewers that their private lateral sewer is attached to that to that line they're, they're so actually like, and I can clarify we looking at the conditions again we did originally have a 20 foot wide utility easement it is over the entire portion of this alley right away so there's a utility easement over the entire portion of it. Right. Originally it did state 20 feet, but that had been changed so that the entire portion is a utility easement. So that takes care of what Councilman Scott condition, said? About. Condition number three, yeah, that for access to the utilities there, and maybe that needs to be clarified a little bit more. Let's see, it's... It's 39 feet wide on one end and 32 foot on the other. If it's if there's a 20-foot easement. Yeah, and I, I misspoke there. Originally, we'd talked about a 20-foot easement, but it is an easement over the entire portion. Over the entire yeah, portion. If you look Everything at Everything that's, that's got hash marks on it, there's an easement there. The hash marks indicate the access easement. The utility easement's over the entire portion. The access is just for driving on that alley, but the utility easement's over the entire portion. The, over the entire, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry for oh, that. Yeah, it does say that on item three, yeah, maintained yeah. over the entire portion of the right-of-way. For utility maintenance. Yep. Okay. 
All right. That takes care of that. Okay. Anything else? No. Good. All right. Then we have um, vacating an alley at 1320, a portion of an alley right away at 1325 Iowa Street. Did sell a, a lot on Iowa Street. Just yeah, this is in the neighbor, right? neighborhood of 1321 Iowa Street, which is uh, just to the north of here. We had an individual at 1325 Iowa Street come in asking to buy that lot that wasn't adjacent to his house. I uh, did inquire about the alley right away there, and there are um, no utilities or uh, issues with vacating that. It does drop down quite a bit to the east, but um, this would be vacating the alley directly behind the property at 1325 Iowa. Um, this did go to the Planning Commission and they voted 4 to 1 to approve vacating uh, the described alley based on that status as a dead end untraveled alleyway with the topography limiting access to the east. Okay. But this would allow him to either expand his garage or uh, put in a paved parking area there for his private vehicles. Okay. Good on that one, Council. I am. Is there a reason why it's just that one portion and not the whole alley? No other property owners desired ownership of it at this time. Uh, and you're does, not wanting to get rid of it. We would like to. It drops down probably 20 or 30 feet from this point to the east, and it's just a, a larger ravine there. So are you looking at doing that as you, this time moves on? It's now? something we'll continue to contact property owners and see their interest in it. Yeah. You know. So are there, I didn't see that, are there utility things there too? No utilities in the alley. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. We're good. Consideration of resolution adopting the Des Moines County Hazard Mitigation Plan. This, who's? Yep. Uh, uh, we have uh, Emory Ellington with Southeast Iowa Regional Planning okay. Commission here to kind of go over. So I'm Emory Ellingson, I'm from the Southeast Iowa Regional Planning Commission, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the Des Moines County Multi-Jurisdictional Pre-Disaster Mitigation Plan. Um, it's quite a name, um, but let's see here. Is it on on the side? Yeah, looks like it. You point it towards the computer over here. Oh, that would probably be why. There you go. Okay. Um, so just kind of a brief introduction on what hazard mitigation is. Uh, it's the effort to reduce loss of life and property damage by reducing the impact of potential disasters. Um, so there's kind of four things that go into it. Being prepared for the disaster, uh, responding if there is a disaster, resiliency, and then recovery. So you can kind of think of the different disasters that we can potentially have here in Des Moines County. Um, so sometimes you think about something like a natural, like a tornado or a flood. They can also be man-made, um, so you might have a hazardous material spill, things of that nature. Um, so the plan itself, um, it's, uh, it, it's required for each county um, in the United States in order to be eligible for funding for hazard mitigation to have a current plan that has been adopted and written. Um, they're updated every five years. The last update for Des Moines County was in 2010. And so this update is the 2015 update. Adopting the plan does not require any expenditure of funds by the adopting jurisdictions, it's something that just has to be adopted by resolution for each county, again, if they wish to remain, remain eligible. Um, so an example of a project that has been done in the past is um, several communities in Des Moines County have added a safe room. I think Burlington did one at, at, this, at the high school a couple years ago. And again, that was made possible by the fact that the county had on record, had adopted the plan. 
Um, and then each, each jurisdiction has to. So City of Burlington participated along with other communities in the county. And it's a pretty large document, so I didn't bring the entire thing. Um, but it has pretty much five sections <coughs> that I'll just kind of give you a brief overview. Um, so there was public input to the process. Um, in putting the plan together, we had a steering committee composed of uh, representatives from each of the jurisdictions. Um, and then we also met with city staff. So we met with Public Works, planning development here for the city of Burlington. Because there is a section of the plan where you do mention specific either hazards to a community. Um, you know, communities are different. So here in Burlington, you know, we're going to have more risk from flood than maybe other communities in the county. And then there was also a public input meeting that was held at the public library on August 19th. So again, you have um, the opportunity for the public to be involved in the process. Um, community profile section of the document is basically just giving a lot of background to the county, different communities. Um, and so that's the first section of the document. Second section is, and this is where the steering committee came into play, is we ranked, well, we identified and then ranked the hazards um, that are a threat to Des Moines County and kind of using that scoring matrix. Um, because as you go through the plan, that's part of it. So here in Des Moines County, for example, we don't have a risk as much from earthquake. I mean, you can see it was number 17 as we do from other hazards. So that's where it kind of comes into play where we'll have a different plan than maybe a community in California would or a community in Florida. Um, the third part of the plan is mitigation strategies. Now each community, uh, adopt, this is what you'll be adopting with the plan is each community has these strategies and again, these don't require any expenditure of funds, but it gives the community direction um, to pursue with their mitigation strategies. So this one, for example, um, develop and implement different hazard education programs. Um, and then I have the full list um, if you are interested in seeing what ones were picked for the city of Burlington. And again, that was done in coordination with city staff. And then here's the timeline. So this was all started back in January 2015. Steering committee meetings were held basically January through May. Uh, the plan was completed, the first draft in August. We had the public review. Um, it was sent for FEMA for review and, review and approval. And FEMA did approve it on November 5th, 2015. And the last step is you just have each participating jurisdiction adopted by resolution. So that's what, why we're here today. So if you have any questions. Okay. Where is the actual copy that someone could look um, at? The actual copy, uh, we can we, we, put you. We did place that on our website under the development department. I can show okay. quickly here. If you go to the city's website, BurlingtonIowa.org, and go to the community development department, um, there is a link on the left-hand side of the page, pre-disaster mitigation plan. So if you just click on that, the uh, 200 or 300 page document will take a while, but it'll open and you can review the entire document there. Okay. And I guess the part where I mentioned the mitigation strategies, that'd be more specific to Burlington. And they're all right there, um, the highlighted ones. Oh, boy. So if you want to take a look at that, feel free. Did you want to just read through that? You want me to read it to you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks anyway. <laughs> so. How does this relate, if at all, to the flood mitigation process? That we're, you certainly should be a part of it, I would guess. If, if I'm correct, well, for applying for those funds, that was one of the requirements, right? I yeah. believe so. Since you have an adopted plan, um, okay. you have to have it on record. That's kind of part of the application process. So. Okay. <clears throat> I know it's in Lee County, but does this, did it change because we have a fertilizer plant being built down there? Did, did something have to change in this because of that? No, there just, the, well, did you notice the hazard or? I haven't had time to look at it. Okay. Is well, there it is, up, it's hazard? just every five years you have to update it. Yeah. It doesn't, it just happened to be in 2010, the last time Des Moines County had one. So it's just, this is the update. The next one will be 2020. Just the timeline. Okay. I'll put that in the reader file. Yeah. Okay. If I can, can I have this, Emory? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want a copy? 
I'll, I'll just put it in our right in the file. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Did it ever load? Yes, it did. Okay. Those of you that are interested, Larry, something for you to do before you go to bed tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I have another book ahead of that. <laughs> okay. All right, we have a permanent encroachment agreement with Hope Haven at 617 Jefferson Street for their new building. This is for access to the building. Um, with this property is actually located uh, partially in the 100 year floodplain, uh, so they did have to elevate the main floor elevation of the building, uh, and they elevated it a foot above that. Uh, with that, uh, some the entrance off of Jefferson Street and 7th Street um, do need some stair or ramp access, and so they are uh, looking at installing those. Um, a little difficult to see here, but uh, the entrance into Jefferson would have a ramp coming uh, from the east with stairs on the west side, and then the entrance off of 7th Street would have a, a stair access as well. Um, those are located within the city right away, um, approximately four feet each. They do maintain the adequate travel portion for the sidewalk. Um, I believe at least eight feet on Jefferson and uh, six feet on South 7th Street. So there's still <coughs> adequate tra travel distance around those as well. Questions? No, no, okay. Thank you, Eric. All right, then we have these two ordinance, second reading for these ordinance for, um, the, you know, for the high V expansion project. Anything else we need to talk about? Nothing's changed. Wave. I don't think you need yeah. to go a third time. Yeah, can we do that? I don't see any. From both of them? Yes. Yeah. I would. We didn't have any uh, questions the other night. No. If we don't have any questions this time, then mm -mm. I don't see any reason not to do that. I agree with you, Councilman Scott. All right. Christine subdivision for preliminary plat. <coughs> This is a seven lot subdivision located off of Plank Street, uh, just uh, north of Agency and east of Gunnison Street. Uh, currently there's a, I guess one building there, uh, somewhat used for storage. Uh, it is zoned M1, uh, light industrial that area is. Uh, I think there's a letter in there from uh, the owner, Don Harder as well, who wasn't gonna be able to attend the meeting, but um, it shows just the general area, a little more reference to where it's at. Uh, there's no new utilities uh, for the site, um, but it, based on the number of lots that they are splitting, it does have to go through the preliminary and final plat process. Uh, this did go to the City Planning Commission, um, and it, they voted five to zero to recommend approval of the preliminary plat to the City Council. Okay. Yeah. The interest in it had been for storage or some contractors that uh, maybe need some off-site storage uh, and constructing a building on this site uh, would, based on the zoning, would meet our requirements. I don't have a problem with that. Any, are they going to be required to have a hard surface? Yeah, any new construction would require hard surface paving. Yep. They all do have access on Plank Street. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. That lot one has a little small. Yeah, and it has access up off of the end of Gunnison, but also on okay. Plank Street. Yeah, I see. All right, I see that. Gunnison kind of ends towards. It's really not a bad property. It's and it's a good use, I think. Yeah. But yeah. Where it's located. I think Don's done a nice job cleaning it up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything? House on that one, Council? No, not for me. <clears throat> now we have another addition to the Westbrook Estate Subdivision. Two 
two lots, I think, Eric? Is that yeah, right? this is a two lot subdivision. Based on the lot size, it does have to go through our subdivision process. If they're smaller lots, they could go through a plat of survey, but um, these are these two lots are intended to be connected to the lots to the west, so they're not going to be built upon by themselves. Um, the two lots to the west are smaller lots, I guess, for this subdivision, and based on the future development to the east with the street connecting through, uh, this was kind of a dead area that they wouldn't be able to plat lots out anyway, so wanted to go ahead and add these these to the existing homes to the west. Oh, okay. So they're not going to be new homes on them, they'll just be connected in larger lots for the homes that are already there. Okay. What do you think? We okay? Yeah. Okay, 300 Washington Street. Kind of the ongoing had some discussion previously on this uh, do have the deeds prepared but uh, based on our attorney's uh, recommendation did need a resolution accepting the deeds I know before is authorizing uh, purchase of the property but this actually uh, <coughs> authorized the acceptance of the deeds the actual transfer um, from the owner of Carl Van Hefton so kind of a, a technical legal thing seems to be somewhat redundant but just the that acceptance word was important for him to have that deed transfer so what do we do with this building now? downtown partners has uh, already agreed to purchase uh, with some conditions was that 25,000 that they were looking to put into a an escrow, or deposit an escrow fund? for the work to be done mm -hmm. uh, that would any sale would have to be done through the, the same type of process where we go through the public hearing with allowing other bids to come in and that would be sort of a minute of four of what we'd be requiring of any other prospective bidders they once we had it had control of the property they would look to um, get in it and do a review of the structure um, they're t they're willing to take it on regardless but they'd like to be able to also show it to other prospective buyers they've had a couple who have expressed interest but they'd like to be able to see the what what it looks like on the inside um, and they may be in they may be in a position where they're able to work around a quick resale um, after I mean, we have the preconditions of they need to get the roof taken care of so okay. somehow that would have to that is be done the deal, but uh, they <clears throat> may also be in a position where they have to uh, do a larger project they have some funds that they've they have 70,000 of funds that are set aside for that type of work and then the potential to go after additional funding if there's the need to as part of that process and I guess I wasn't even thinking about you being in a room Steve I don't know if there's anything additional that you wanted to add on that behalf <clears throat> and tied to this as Steve's coming up here we do have a set date for public hearing for March 7th for the sale of the property yeah, I saw that. Steve Freevert, uh, director of Downtown Partners. And I want to clarify, so there's language that, that states the current owner can remove non-structural components? Personal property okay. typewriters and storage units. Because because we want to make sure there's certain things, fireplaces, yeah. light fixtures, um, flooring, mm -hmm. trim, doors, that kind of thing yeah. that stays with the building. Yep. Have you been in the building? Uh, it's been about two years ago that I was well yeah about a year and a half ago yeah. thank you Steve so this, you're saying is it just a formality then as you're saying Eric? this yeah it's the this resolution we've already authorized purchase of the building but this is just adding the one word acceptance of the deed so okay I'd, I don't quite understand it, but we just do what attorneys tell us sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yes. which is a good thing, I suppose. Yes, and sometimes we wonder why they tell us, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shall we move on? Yes. Yeah. Eric, are you talking about the urban revitalization? Stephanie. Yeah. Exemption. Oh, Stephanie. Yes. Oh, good. So, in your packet was a resolution. You. <clears throat> so 
So this resolution is something we do annually. Um, citizens have up until January um, 31st to put in for their tax abatement form where they've had either um, new construction or residential renovation, commercial. Um, so basically your exhibit A of, on the resolution just shows um, all the new homes that were built that applied for this tax exemption. And that's where they have the option of doing 100% tax abatement for three years or a sliding scale for 10 years on residential. Um, then the next section shows re re residential renovations. They have that same option, three year, 10 year sliding scale. Um, then we had a few, uh, we had one multi-residential, family residential, so that's um, apartment complexes. And we did have one op upper story on Jefferson. And then it looks like about five business commercial renovations that applied for the tax abatement. So basically, you approve this resolution. It gets um, sent over to the county. Um, these dollar amounts here are just the estimates that the um, property owners gave us on what it was costing, which doesn't mean um, the pro or doesn't mean a taxable value by any means. The county determines that. So, like I said, we do this once a year. So the other sheets I did hand out to you is just some additional information on tax abatement. Um, that first sheet, this comes from the county actually. So these are um, exemption values, tax values that are being abated right now. We have the 2014 year and then the 2015 year. And then they broke it down by the type, type of property. Um, so that first one, it's um, the 10 year commercial um, basically, um, last year we abated about four million. This year it's going to be 3.1 million. So overall, you can see at the bottom um, the the abatement amounts did go down this year, which is good. That means 3.2 million of taxable valuation went back on to our books. Good. So, but we just um, thought th this is better information if you're looking at how much annually is being abated. So. And then the second one is just a kind of a stat sheet that we do every year. It just shows um, since inception of the program, which is, was in 1992, just shows the number of applicants, um, who selected the three year 100%, who selected the 10 years, and then again, that valuation um, data. And that again was just the numbers they gave the city. So that's not truly the tax abatement amount, but just some stats to see um, if you're interested can't sleep at night you want to look at it so <laughs> does anybody have any questions or okay thanks <laughs> thank you Steph. <laughs> okay any questions Not for about me. that <clears throat> all right we have on the consent agenda we're setting uh, <coughs> four public hearing dates on March 7th, the plans for the 2016 HMA resurfacing project, uh, consideration of a sale of property at 115 Gulf Lane, consideration of sale of property at 300 Washington Street, and a consideration of the fiscal year 2016-17 budget. And those are taking place on March 7th. There is an appointment, and now what else do you want to say about the last item here, Jim, about the budget? Well, really, the last item on the budget would, we, we've prepared the public hearing, what Stephanie has put in the packet for, uh, that the, for, the state forms that you see in here are based off of what was, has been presented and discussed. Um, she, she's noted on the public hearing state, statement, uh, the total estimated tax levy at the 15.93632. Uh, as well as, and then the ag land, the 3.00375, those are the same as the current year. Um, <coughs> you'll see the breakdown of expenditures and revenues uh, by category. This sort of establishes, as we go and publish this, that ex this will establish the maximum that we can expend in next year's budget by those various state uh, divided categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, they hold us accountable t to that. If we go to look to have any adjustments occur from that, um, we have to go through a budget amendment process. Um, we've gone through a budget amendment process, I think, the last two years. We probably have one this year, too. Maybe, maybe not. I guess we haven't really talked about it because we're not to that point to have to worry about it. 
Um, it's not atypical for us to have to do an amendment at the end of the year or by the, before the end of the year. Right. Okay. okay. This the fun part about spending fifty million dollars in a budget that includes about ten million of transfers back and forth between funds. Um, it's it does set our maximums. Um, we express it in in our budget book that we'll develop. Is that done or when is that done and out the budget book? Oh, not until this is approved. Not until this is approved. That's a 400 page document that lists out in line item detail. Um, and here we put it into a 12 page state format uh, that's much shorter, uh, more succinct, and probably just as incomprehensible as our 400 pages. <laughs> it's the difficult part about it. It's hard to make it real. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions about this one? Not about this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did, no? No. I'm okay. good. <laughs> okay. Are you done with that? Yeah, I think so. All right. That's the end of our agenda. Wow. Yeah. Councilwoman Wilson, do you have anything to mention? Um, I think we all got an email. Oh, um, about the... About Apollo. Apollo. I thought we could discuss that a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, Eric, you, your department has received a phone call and had some communications from that individual. I think she wanted to do a tour of the Apollo structure as well. What's what's happened with that? I'll have to check with Charlie. I think some of the thought was that wanted to, I guess, inquiring whether who would be responsible for fixing it up and whether it'd be a lease or purchase. I don't believe it'd be something where they'd be able to undertake the whole building and probably be some cost to the city at that. Um, our per previous discussions have been with developers looking to acquire the whole mm -hmm. building and take it on as a project and not have the city involved in it. So I can get some more details on our conversations that yes, our please. inspectors have had. And is that, as you're discussing that option or thinking about what's been proposed, because she hasn't shown, well, she's wanting to, do some of the steps afterwards. We, we'll have another proposal coming to us. In fact, we did a uh, request from Peter Schwier, Schwier Miller Valentine. with Miller Valentine uh, to look at this. He, he sent us an email back at the end of, very end of December, and we told him that we kind of wanted to wait till we get got through the budget process to for any consideration. He'd like to look at. Um, some level of an offer to purchase that had some contingencies built into it, gave them the ability to control it for a period of time. Uh, their, their goal with that is to rehab that facility for housing. At least that was my take on it. I think there's two options, whether it's rehab that or demolish that and build new. And build new housing. Yeah, looking at both options. Um, they're looking at if they're going to do a rehab, they're looking at multiple funding sources that will take a period of yeah. of a year to you know to go through for applications for them. They all have different time frames on them. Um, there's some some merit to that as well, and I think it makes sense to have both of them come at some point to be brought brought forward uh, for consideration from the council. Um, his is. Theirs is going to be more of an outright purchase with some of those contingencies built in, and I'm assuming hers is a little bit different just from the structure of the email. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in, in order for you to be able to consider, especially when they're in doing different things, uh, you're going to need to get some more details from both of them to be right. able to evaluate them in comparison to each other. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Is she coming? I assume she was from out of town somewhere, was it? Sioux City. Okay. Okay. Is that it, Annie? Yes. Okay. When will the people, uh, Nothing tonight. Okay. When will the people here on the uh, Maple Street 
school thing. Do you know what the time is on that? It's in March. I think they've heard, had some favorable initial reviews on it, uh, but they don't formally hear until March. But okay. they've heard some positive things on where they're at in the process. So, thank you. <clears throat> I was. Is that it, sir? Yeah, oh else? yes. I, I took some time Saturday morning going over to watch the fireman testing. Uh, I was glad I didn't have to do it, <laughs> but the, the people that did do it seemed like they did pretty well. So I, I think we have some good candidates, don't we? So, yes. Yeah, so that's good. And we want to say goodbye to Kathleen. She's what? leaving us. Oh. Uh, Kathleen Sloan, that is. And, uh, <laughs> oh. wish, wish you well, Kathleen. Where are you going, Kathleen? Florida. She's Florida. moving to Florida, of all things. That's where all the mosquitoes are. Where's your boots for the last time? Yeah, give her a hard time about those boots, yeah. <laughs> well, good luck to you. That's... And I did want to mention uh, a friend of mine whose uh, funeral is being t held tomorrow, a former employee of the Burlington uh, City, uh, Charles Myers, it mostly known as Lindy. He worked at uh, vehicle maintenance for a number of years, but retired quite a while ago. I don't know if any of you would have been around at, at that time. Uh, really a nice man with a great family, so um, I wanted to express my condolences to them. Mr. Fernell? Uh, this afternoon was able to go over and participate in the school's uh, meeting with Dave Loebsack, Congressman Loebsack. Uh, they were talking about the sectors program, which I don't know a tremendous amount about. Uh, but part of it has to do with their job training programs that they're, they're trying to implement with the students, both their construction trades, uh, for rehabbing existing housing and the potential to build some new housing. Uh, that's a focus they have that they're looking to begin this next school year. Um, we've offered up, from a staff perspective at least, the idea of us uh, participating with their efforts to try to uh, see, see a, a homes over time uh, transition into their program uh, for, for rehab purposes. Uh, the idea that was brought to, this, to us from the school was uh, as we have homes that we acquire through the 657A process, if there would be the ability to have, I think they're looking at one home a year at this point from my understanding uh, to have a class rehab that and then try to get that back out onto the market. Uh, their goal that they've expressed is to have it go into um, home ownership for a low to moderate income family, uh, give them an opportunity to buy a, buy a house at a much lower cost of acquisition costs than what the open market would potentially have. Um, that serves a couple of neat purposes for the city if we're involved in that. Uh, one for the, the initial and the main purpose that we would see is being able to participate and cooperate with the school for their training program for their students. But it has a, a side benefit of helping with neighborhood stabilization efforts. Uh, the more homes that we see be able to get into a spot where we're taking when we're taking homes through the 657A process, those are typically homes that have been abandoned. Um, we're not only able to get them back out in the market, but in that program, we're able to put them into a home ownership situation, which is a major benefit to the community as a whole. Now, we haven't had a proposal like this come yet before the, the council, but we've expressed from the staff perspective that we're strongly in support of of having this occur and you you will be getting a proposal at some point whenever they've identified what they'd like to see for a home uh, the, the idea of us donating a property into that program um, we are continuing to work on union negotiations uh, we met with ask me today or are we close to settling today no in fact I think what's the official word from today yeah, we'll be going into a mediation process at this point. Um, there's a, if you get to a spot where what's, what is it called, impasse, you, you get to two steps 
The first is mediation, and if you can't come to some sort of a compromise there, it goes to an arbitration. Arbitration. For, so we are at that spot with, with that uh, union group. Um, we still have, we have not reached a, that spot nor a settlement yet with CWA, and we'll see where that goes as time goes on here over the course of the next couple of weeks. It's the best I can tell you for right now. CWA is placed. That is CWA. <laughs> All these initials. Yeah, I can't keep them straight, so that's why I have to look back at <laughs> Stephanie to make sure that I get the right group. So, yeah, if you have any questions, you can certainly ask me. But okay, is that it? Is that it? That's it. Thank you. <laughs>